Gentlemen, what is going on today? My name is Ryan Mickler. I'm your host and the founder of this, the Order of Man podcast and movement. Welcome to 2024. Ready or not, here it is. And I hope that uh, it's starting off on the right foot. I hope that things are going well for you. Uh, and I hope that this year we can provide you with the tools, conversations, resources, everything that you might need to be able to thrive as a man. That's what we're doing. For almost nine years now, we've been working to reclaim and restore masculinity to its rightful place, a place of respect, a place of service, as it says uh, over my shoulder, uh, protect, provide, preside. It's our opportunity to serve other people, uh, serve our family members, our communities, the people that we have a responsibility for, the people that we have an obligation to serve. So if I can give you what you need to be able to do that more effectively, then I figure that's a uh, mission accomplished. And I'm really glad that you're tuning in. Uh, we're going to get into a very important discussion today because 2024 is likely, not even likely, I would say guaranteed to present you with uh, some challenging situations, whether they're self-inflicted uh, or whether they're completely outside of your control. You are going to be confronted as you are every single year with challenge, heartache, heartbreak, adversity, struggle, and your ability to overcome these things will spell the difference between success for you and yours and utter and complete failure, as many of us have done in the past. I don't want you to fail. Uh, I don't want you to struggle unnecessarily. Granted, we're all going to fail. We're all going to struggle. I don't want that to be unnecessary. And I don't want the people that are impacted by the decisions that we're making and the way that we're leading to be negatively affected by our inability to handle adversity like a man. What might that adversity be? Loss of a job, medical diagnosis, losing a loved one, going through a divorce, filing bankruptcy, going through a lawsuit, any number of things that you and I have dealt with or will deal with in our life. And it could even be much more simple than that. Maybe there's a fire to put out at work. Maybe a client is bothered with you and upset about the way that you handled a situation. Maybe your boss is frustrated because you failed to meet a project deadline or didn't complete it to the standard. These are things that can be addressed, but if we lose our mind and we lose our cool and we blow up and we let our emotions rule and dictate the way that we handle these situations, not only do we take a project that maybe wasn't done to par, but we compound it and we end up losing our job. Or you have that discussion with your significant other, your wife, and instead of handling it like a man would handle it with some class and grace and maturity, you blow up, lose your cool, and erode and undermine to the detriment of your marriage. We can make it worse or we can make it better the way that we show up. Now, I'm going to share with you today five mindsets that you can hopefully consider, ponder on, chew on a little bit that might help you handle whatever adversity you may be going through right now. And I've gone through my fair share of adversity. 2023 was in a lot of ways, a very good year, a growing year for me. And in a lot of ways, it was riddled with adversity. And I feel like if I was dropped into the same situation in, in the future, that I would handle it very much the same way that I handled my situation in 2023, which means that I passed the test. Now, I don't know that it's a test necessarily. It might be, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but I feel like I did what a man would do given the circumstances that I found myself in. And also, to be honest, the circumstances that I created for myself. So five mindsets that you can incorporate that are going to help you be more manly as it relates to dealing with hardship and struggle and adversity and challenge. Now, inevitably, when I say be more manly or become a man, you have a sub- group of people who will say, who are you to decide? It isn't me. It's an objective standard. Now, sometimes I have a bias or an opinion about what a man ought to do and how he ought to show up, but I'm sure that you'd be willing to agree, especially because you're listening to this podcast, that the standard of the way that we show up with a level of maturity and grace and class and um, empathy and our ability to help other people successfully navigate hardship is a hallmark, hallmark of masculinity not my opinion. It's something that thousands and thousands of years of human history and evolution have taught us as to why and how we show up as men. 
Before I get into that, I do want to mention that one way that you could put not only the results of becoming a better man on hyperdrive, but your results on improving what it is you want to accomplish in 2024 is by joining our exclusive brotherhood, the Iron Council, where we are all in a brotherhood. We're all standing shoulder to shoulder. We're all working side by side. We're going through our battle plans. We're helping us each other hone and refine and fine tune these battle plans. And then ultimately leading that to action so that we can improve our circumstances and the circumstances of the people that are uh, following us, whether it's your children or your wife or your colleagues or your coworkers, your neighbors, or whoever it might be. If you are interested in learning a little bit more, we're open until January 7th. You're listening to this on January 5th, Friday, January 5th, which means that you only have a couple of days before we shut it down and we don't open up again for another two or three months. If you are interested in knowing what we do and how it might benefit you, then you can go to theironcouncil.com theironcouncil.com, or you can go to orderaman.com slash ironcouncil. Either one of those will take you to some information and a video that you can watch and learn more about what we're doing. Again, orderofman.com slash ironcouncil. All right, man, let's get into the five bullet points that I had created today and thought about with regards to handling adversity like a man. Number one is we need to realize that our energy is infectious. Our energy is infectious. In fact, I pulled this up because I thought this was really important as I took some notes and considered what I wanted to share with you today, I was reminded of the poem If by Rudyard Kipling. And the very first sentence of that poem, and most of you guys know about this poem, if you don't go, please read it because it's crucial for your development as a man. But the very first line is this, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. Let me say that again. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. Guys, energy is infectious. I'll give you a little bit of a, a uh, physics lesson here. Energy cannot be created nor destroyed. It cannot be created nor destroyed. Energy can only be transferred. It's either static or kinetic, meaning it's just sitting there as potential energy or it's in motion. And that would be kinetic energy. Guys, we have energy. The way that we show up for our significant other, the way that you show up for your kids, the way you show up to work, the way you listen to this podcast, people are observing you. People are watching you. If you're dealt with a challenging situation at work and you're frantic and chaotic and out of control and emotionally volatile, do you think that the transfer of energy is going to be one of peace and calmness and stillness and clarity towards what needs to be done in order to address the situation at hand. If as a first responder or a law enforcement officer, you go into a situation when somebody is dealing with potentially one of the most horrific experiences of their life, maybe that's a fire or a natural disaster, active shooter situation, violent crime, domestic abuse, and you go into this environment, they're already upset. They're already freaking out. They're already losing their mind because they're not trained. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a minute. And you go into that environment with the same franticness of what they're dealing with. Do you think that's going to subdue the situation? Or do you think that's going to escalate the situation? Well, intuitively, we know it's going to escalate the situation and it's going to make a bad situation worse. Your energy level is crucial. If you're sporadic, if you're chaotic, if you're frustrated, if you're volatile, if you're prone to emotional outbursts, you're making the situation worse. Now, the beautiful thing about this is we get to decide how we show up. You get to decide today, how do I show up? When confronted with a challenging circumstance, do you lose your mind and slip into this lizard brain where we're just thinking about the fight or flight. We're not even thinking about it, frankly. We're just operating from a fight or flight, pure survival position. Or do you actually realize that you're a human being who has evolved into this incredible problem-solving, evolving machine, which is what we are as humans? Which one of those do you become? 
The first is reacting. And when you're reacting, you're playing defense. You're behind the eight ball. And when you're behind the eight ball, you're really struggling because there's a lot of fear. We're going to talk more about that too. There's a lot of fear that's driving your response or your reaction. If on the other hand, you stay out ahead of it and you realize that you're going to be intentional, maybe that's taking a breath. Maybe that's being well-trained so you can deal with adversity. And you're going to be intentional about how you respond because you know that the energy you bring to the equation is going to be transferred to go back to our physics lesson to the other person that you're dealing with. If your wife is upset with you and yelling at you for whatever reason, and you come and get defensive and decide to yell back, is that going to escalate the situation or diffuse the situation? Your goal is to diffuse the situation so that you can move forward towards a resolution, a healthy resolution that helps both parties win. If you are angry and upset and emotional and yelling and name calling and getting personal and getting ugly, you're making the problem worse. And you're not handling the adversity like a man, you're handling it like a boy. What does a boy do when he does not get what he wants? If he's young enough and immature enough, he literally may thrust himself onto the ground, bang his fist on the ground and kick his feet and cry because he's not getting what he wants. Now, most of us chalk that up to being a toddler, not getting the cereal that he wants uh, at the grocery store. But I've seen grown men engage in very similar behavior, at least deep down. It may not, the physical manifestation not be thrust themselves onto the ground and throw a temper tantrum, but they might get passive aggressive. They might even get aggressive. They might even get violent in some cases. And it's the same thing as the two-year-old throwing himself on the ground because he got fruity pebbles instead of lucky charms. Guys, we can do better than that by taking a breath, realizing what we're dealing with. I'm going to talk a little bit more about some other things that I think will help us do that. And then approaching the adversity with a level of calmness and clarity so that we can move towards resolution. Number two, we must realize that adversity comes and adversity goes. Whatever you're dealing with, barring terminal illness, is something that will pass. It may not feel like it. I went through a divorce in 2023. I went through a situation where I had to explain that divorce to a degree um, and explain explain my alcohol abuse in a very public way. It was hard for me in that moment to realize that this is just a moment in time. This isn't the end, but fortunately, I had enough wits about me that I realized that even though other people were going to mock me, belittle me, put me down, call me names, get personal, that this was just a moment in time. And that the way that I responded moving forward was going to spell the difference between success in this current venture and potential failure. I knew even in the depths of despair that this was going to pass very hard circumstances and situations. And I knew that it was going to pass. And you know what else I know? I know that even though that adversity has passed for the most part, there's going to be new adversity that I'm going to deal with. And because I'm aware of that, I can make sure that I plan ahead. I can make sure that I remain humble I can make sure that I remain in a constant state of learning, growing, self-evaluation and awareness and improvement. So when these situations inevitably rise, I'm more capable of dealing with those things. There's challenges and hardships that I've gone through at 42 years old that I could not handle, literally could not handle at age 18. And I would like to say that at age 60, I'll be able to handle circumstances that I could not possibly handle when I was 42. Guys, adversity comes. It's a natural part of life. If we spend our entire lives avoiding, running away from, hiding from the adversity, number one, we're not going to grow. Number two, it's going to find you anyways, and you're going to find yourself unprepared to deal with whatever life has to thrust at you. Also, it will pass. Nothing is permanent. I know that whatever you're dealing with, divorce, bankruptcy, medical issues, lawsuits, somebody calling you a mean name, it's going to pass. And what I would like to do in my own life 
is to be able to look back and say, you know what? You handled that situation like a man. It wasn't a great situation. It was unfortunate that it was either thrust upon you or you did it to yourself, but it is what it is. And in the given set of circumstances, you handled yourself well. I would love to look back, and I cannot say this is true, but I would love to look back in my life and say, every obstacle I dealt with, I handled like a man. That hasn't always been the case, but I'm forward thinking. And so as I'm presented with challenges, I'm willing to project myself out into a future date and even ask, how would the guy that I want to be handle this circumstance? How would the guy who I want to be handle a divorce or a bankruptcy or a lawsuit or a medical diagnosis? What would that guy do? And then become that guy. Because you know what? Life's going to get better. And you want to be able to look back at yourself and the people around you with some pride and some dignity. Maintain your dignity. I've seen grown men stumble, inevitably and completely self-destruct. Man, have some self-respect, have some dignity. Things don't always work out. You may suffer the consequences of your poor decisions as I have, but have some class, have some dignity, stand up, dust yourself off, improve, get better. So that when the challenge passes and it will, at least you have your honor and your respect intact. Number three, adversity is opportunity. Adversity is opportunity. You know what I actually like? Is I, in a way, like that not everybody can deal with adversity the same way I can. You know why? Because it presents opportunities afforded to me that not everybody else will get to capitalize on. For example, if a client is potentially working with me as a financial advisor. I use that example because I was a financial advisor in another life. And they're working and meeting with me, but they're also meeting with another financial advisor. I love when that individual brings up challenges. I love when they bring up objections or concerns they may have because it provides me an opportunity to educate them on why they don't need to worry about that or how we're going to hedge against that or how we're going to improve their circumstances in light of that information. But you know what? Not everybody will do that. And the cream rises to the crop. Uh, cream rises to the top, excuse me. Which means that as adversity presents itself, everybody else is going to throw in the towel. Podcasting is a great example. How many people started podcasts? Maybe you're one of them. And it got hard or it got boring or you didn't have a guest or you couldn't make any money doing it. And so you threw in the towel. Good. Now, I, because I'm trying to serve you as a man, like I don't want that to happen, but that presents an opportunity to me, to me who is willing to stay in the game, who's willing to deal with not as many people listening as I'd like, who's willing to overcome the fact that maybe they couldn't get a guest for a, a specific week and making something work. Those are opportunities. The other thing I'd have you consider is that sometimes people believe that their external circumstances will change their their current reality. For example, if only I had enough money, then my life would be better. If only my wife acted this way, then our relationship would be great. If only my boss wasn't such a dickhead, then I would be happy with my employment. Guys, it doesn't work like that. I call it God. It is God. But if you want to call it the universe or karma or Jiminy Cricket for all I care, there's going to be opportunity presented to you in the form of adversity to prove that you're ready for the next chapter, the next level. And you don't get to pass the, or excuse me, you don't get to elevate yourself to the next level until you pass the previous level. It's like a game. If you're playing a game, you don't get to improve your character until you prove yourself competent in a certain set of skills on that game console. It's the same thing in life. You guys say you want more money, but you're not willing to do what you need to do to make more money. You say you want a better relationship and you just wish that God came down, touched you on the forehead with his finger and bestowed it upon you. 
be great, but you're not worthy of it yet. And I'm not talking about human worth. I'm not talking about your worth as a human being. We're discerning here. I'm talking about your worth or worthiness of getting the pay raise or having that relationship or completing that marathon or fill in the blank with whatever your objective is. You're not worthy of that result yet. And if by some miracle you achieve that, it's not sustainable. I'll give you an example of that. Lottery winners. Go back and look at the statistics, the data. And I don't have that right pulled up in front of me, but I've seen statistics that show that lottery winners will go broke within a matter of a few short years of winning millions and millions of dollars. And not only broke, in many cases, worse off, owing more money than they did before they had that landfall. Why? Because they weren't worthy of the $10 million they won. They were operating from a $30,000 a year mindset. And now all of a sudden they're given $10 million. Do you think that they automatically have all the financial acumen that comes with somebody who earns $10 million? Of course not. So they fall into their old patterns, their old ways. And this is why, by the way, if you were to take all the money in the world, and we're talking about income distribution right now, all the money in the world and distribute it evenly between the, what is it, 9 billion people on the planet right now? I'd be willing to bet that within a few short years, the majority of the money would trickle back into the hands of the people who have it now. Oftentimes, people like to reference the elite. They're manipulating people. They're taking advantage of people. They're not paying their fair share. No, the elite, no, and I'm talking about financially elite. I'm not saying, again, worth as a human being. I don't subscribe to that, but their financial acumen, they know things that you don't know. If you knew what those things were and you implemented them, you would be in that club, but you're not, and I'm not either because I'm not doing what they're doing. So the best thing that you can do if you want something is to make yourself worthy of having that thing. If you're in a marriage and you want that to be a thriving marriage, then you have to do today what people in thriving marriages and relationships do. And then the result will come. If you want to make a million dollars this year, then you don't make the million dollars first. You do what the million dollar annual income earners do. And then the inevitable outcome is the million dollars a year. If you want to run a marathon, you don't just get up off the couch after being out of the game for 10 years and go run a marathon. You might actually die doing that. So you have to do what marathon runners do. They train, they eat right, they sleep, they recover, they hire coaches, and then you're deemed worthy of being able to be a quote unquote marathon runner. If you want to write a book this year, you have to do what authors do, and then you will experience the result. The thing that you need to know is that anybody that you've ever heard on my podcast, and I've interviewed over 450 incredibly successful men in their own right in different avenues and facets of life. Some people tend to believe that these are individuals who are free of adversity from their life. Oh man, if I was that guy, then my life would be easy. Yeah, I'd be a millionaire too. Yeah, I'd have a successful business too. Yeah, I'd be an ultra athlete too. Yeah, I'd be a scholar too. No, you wouldn't. Because if you had the skill set of those individuals, you would be what those individuals are. You, you aren't those individuals, which means you don't do what they do. And I'm not casting stones. I'm in the same boat. If there's somebody I aspire to be like, then I don't get to just be like that person. I have to do what that person does in order to manifest and yield that result. Number four, let's realize our triggers and where they come from. And I wrote a couple of different things here. Number one, awareness. This is about self-awareness. If you feel yourself getting heated and bothered about something, I think it's a good idea to ask yourself, why do I feel this way? If a client calls you up and says, hey, I don't want to work with you anymore. I want to work with uh, the guy down the road um, at the other uh, financial planning firm. That might be upsetting to you. And I think that'd be upsetting to anybody. But certain men are going to handle that with class and grace and say, hey, man, 
hate to hear that you're leaving. Do you mind explaining why? So I might be able to improve my practice for other people moving forward. That's a mature way to handle that, by the way. An immature boy, child, prepubescent, at least emotionally, might say, well, that guy's an idiot. I can't believe you do that. And man, I, you, you're not going to be loyal. You've been working with me. And now all of a sudden, you're just going to jump ship because of dot, 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 dot. That's immaturity. That's a trigger. There's something going on. Why are you so upset? In the past, I've been like that. And the reason I was set upset in this particular instance or this set of circumstances is because I wasn't doing enough marketing to have other clients. If at this stage, somebody messages me and says, hey, I'm not going to be in the Iron Council anymore. I'm not personally offended by that because I'm doing a good enough job marketing and value proposition and creating value in men's lives that one person leaving for whatever reason isn't going to cripple our business. 100 people leaving isn't going to cripple my business because I'm doing the work required. Same with you. If you have one client leave, if you're upset about that, it's because you're not doing the work. If somebody says something to you and belittles you or mocks you or undermines you or makes a passive aggressive comment or criticizes you and you become emotionally vested in what that individual is saying, there's something deeper there that you have to figure out. Why is this an issue for me? It could be that your abusive father used to treat you that way. And so it represents him and you hate and despise him as a man. And so everybody else who says that thing or talks to you that way triggers this thought of your father who you despise. That would be important to know because then you can say, all right, well, this person isn't my father. That was an isolated experience. And so maybe they don't even mean what they're saying the way that I'm interpreting it. And I can have a further conversation to clarify. And usually we find that they didn't mean to be offensive at all. It's just they're filtering their response through their own baggage and bullshit throughout life. Be aware of why you're feeling the way you're feeling. Another issue might be integrity. If, if somebody calls you fat or you're a slob and you get offended by that, if somebody called me fat and said I'm a slob, I wouldn't be offended by that because it's not accurate. And I know it's not accurate. If somebody says you're a liar, you're a cheat, you're a scam, and people say that all the time, I'm not offended by that because I know I'm not. Every single week, people say, oh, Ryan, you're just scamming guys who are hurting out of their money. As if that's supposed to be offensive to me. It's not offensive because that's not what I'm doing. And I know that. I'm so grounded in that. What we do as a business is we provide a valuable service that certain people are interested in and we enter into an exchange of value. I give them what they're after and then in, in return, they pay me. It's the nature of business and capitalism and exchange of value. I'm not offended when somebody says you're scamming people because we don't. I would not be offended if somebody called me a lazy piece of crap because I'm not. But if you are scamming, or if you are a lazy piece of crap and somebody calls you that and you're upset about that, that's an integrity gap because you know somewhere deep and down inside there's a tinge of truth to what they're saying and that might be offensive. So what is the integrity gap? Where can you improve? Where can you incorporate more integrity in your life? Uh, the only other thing that I wrote here is that we're driven and I talked about this a little bit earlier, the lizard brain. This is the less evolved. This is the fight or flight response of our brain. It's driven from emotion, fear, and greed. I just dealt with this all the time in the financial planning industry. When the market was doing really well, people would put a ton of money into the market. When's the last time you went into a retail store? Let's say you needed a new pair of pants. You went into a retail store and the associate said, hey, normally these pants are $100, but today we're going to charge $150. And he said, oh, that sounds good. I'll go ahead and do that. You would never do that, but you do it in the stock market. The stock market's up. The stock was $10. Now it's $13. You're like, nah, it sounds like a pretty good deal. No, it's not a good deal. Why are you making that decision? Because you're greedy <coughs> or you're ignorant. And so you think that, hey, if the stock market's good. I'm going to buy it at a premium. Don't buy stuff at a premium. 
That's when you sell it. If everybody else is buying it for the jeans for 130, you sell your $100 jeans for $130 so you can realize the $30 gain. That's a rational approach, but you're driven by fear. You're driven by greed. Same thing with the stock market. When the bottom falls out and that $10 stock turns into $3, you're like, oh, I got to sell this. I got to get rid of this. Fear, fear. Oh, I'm scared. Fear, get rid of it. No, that's not when you sell. If you go into the store and that's that $100 pair of jeans and because it's Christmas time, they say, hey, this is normally $100, but today it's 30 and you need a new pair of jeans. That's when you buy the jeans. It's on sale. Buy it now. Don't sell. Buy it now. When I say it that way, everybody's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, because you're rational right now. When fear creeps in, and greed creeps in, you make dumb decisions. The uncertainty of 2024 could cause you to make dumb decisions. The uncertainty of your wife telling you that she no longer wants to be married triggers you, right? Abandonment, failure, loser. And so you make dumb decisions. We're not going to make dumb decisions. We're going to make rational, clear-headed decisions, knowing that this adversity, whatever it might be, too shall pass. The last point I want to make here is I want to talk a little bit about emotions. There's a lot of misconception, especially in this men's space, that say, oh, don't let emotions rule you. I agree with that. But I think it's taken to the extreme, as in, like, you're never supposed to experience emotions. Guys, emotions are amoral. Please understand that. There's no such thing as a negative emotion. People will tell you there is. Oh, you shouldn't be angry. Oh, you shouldn't be sad. You shouldn't be, don't be sad. Oh, life's hard. Don't be sad. Don't be sad. Don't be sad. It's okay. If something unfortunate is happening in your life, it's okay to be sad. If somebody's taking advantage of you, it's okay to be angry. Now, the way that we respond to those emotion matters those emotions, excuse me, matter. But it's okay to experience and feel what you're feeling. Emotions are amoral. They're neither good nor bad. The response to our emotions is not. If I say, for example, I'm angry about something that happened at work today and I decide to go punch a hole in the wall or worse, punch somebody else for no reason, I think all of us would say that that's an unhealthy expression of emotion. The emotion wasn't the problem. The expression of the emotion was. So guys, let's stop burying our emotion. Like you can be sad. You can be angry. You can be happy. You can, you can be loving. You can be empathetic. If you're feeling those things, feel those things. Let's not over-index them. And what I mean by that is put too much weight in those things. Well, I'm happy because, you know, whatever. And so you make dumb decisions because that happiness is just like driving and, and steering all of your otherwise rational decision-making process. It's just a factor. It's feedback. When you're driving down the road and you have your dashboard there in front of you, you're looking at gauges. You're looking at the temperature of the car. You're looking at the oil pressure. You're looking at your speedometer. You're looking at your mileage. You're looking at your fuel gauge. When the fuel gauge drops from half down to zero and a little light comes on and says, get fuel now, do you get pissed off and slam your car off the road and wrap your truck around the next telephone pole you see because you're mad that the indicator light came on? No. You find the next exit, go to the gas station, turn the car off, put the pump in the tank, turn it on, put your credit card in there, fill up, close the cap, put the pump away, drive back onto the freeway and get on about your day. Same thing with emotions. When you're angry that the client called you and left you, like you don't blow up the business you don't call your thousand other clients and say, I'm out of here. You guys all suck and I'm not doing this anymore. And you can go shove it. <laughs> that would be ridiculous. You chalk it up. You realize, hey, is there something I can learn from this experience? Like, maybe there's a, a way for me to better retain clients or maybe I wasn't adding as much value as that person liked or maybe I wasn't fulfilling my commitments. I'm not mad about it. I'm a little upset. I'm a little maybe hurt. Um, I, I feel maybe a little bit of betrayal. And so that's an indicator that something's off. And then we figure out what's off so that we can improve and not have to deal with it again. Your emotions aren't bad. 
even the so-called negative ones. If you're angry, you can be angry. If you're sad, you can be sad. If you're loving, you can be loving. If you're empathetic, you can be empathetic. If you want to be nurturing, you can be nurturing. Like you, you can be any of those things as a factor for your decision-making process. And then there's other factors. Feedback from qualified sources, your rational level-headed approach, long-term thinking, this sort of thing. So those are my five tips for handling adversity like a man. Now, we didn't get real tactical, and, and I could, but there's an infinite number of circumstances that you're going to be presented with. And so you'll have to figure out how to tactically address those circumstances. And we can talk a little bit more about a tactical approach in a future podcast. But for now, I think if we get the mindsets right, then the tactical approach becomes better. So for example, if a client calls you and says, hey, I'm leaving, and your mindset is, hey, my energy is infectious, so I'm not going to blow up at my client. I'm going to maintain calm, rational communication and dialogue. I'm going to realize that, hey, this is unfortunate. I'm losing a really good client. I like my relationship. I like the income that came from that client, but this will pass and I'll have another client. If you look for opportunities, <clears throat> excuse me. So for example, um, you, you, you might ask a client, hey, is, is there anything that I'm unaware of that, that I could be aware of that will help me in my business as I work with other clients? And they may tell you, hey, you just didn't communicate with me real well. Okay, good. That's good information to have. Realize that, hey, if you're triggered by one client leaving, like if one client blows up your business, there's probably a deeper issue at hand, meaning you need to get some more clients. Instead of having one or three, maybe you have 30 or 300. So one client isn't going to spell the difference between success and failure. And then number five, if you're at angry, again, realizing that emo emotions are a factor, not the only factor, but you're upset and angry about that. Okay, that's the little indicator. That's the little fuel light on the dashboard. Hey, you're angry about this. Why? Let's figure it out so that we can make better decisions moving forward. All right, man. I hope that serves you. I would love to see more of us, and, and I'm working on this too, be more level-headed, be more rational, handle adversity like a man. I mean, people are relying on us. Not only are you going to have a better experience throughout life, but your wife is relying on you. Your children are relying on you. Your colleagues and coworkers and clients and neighbors, they're relying on you. Don't show up as an inferior version of yourself. Show up as the best possible version by incorporating these five things. Again, learning and knowing that energy is infectious. Number two, knowing that adversity comes and it goes. Number three, adversity is opportunity. Number four, realize your triggers. And number five, emotions are a factor, not the only factor. Now, a couple of marching orders as we wrap up today. Number one, go read If by Rudyard Kipling. I think you guys are going to really enjoy that poem if you don't already know of it. Uh, and then number two, check out The Iron Council at orderofman.com slash iron council. All right, guys, we'll be back next week. Until then, go out there, take action, handle adversity like a man, and become the man you are meant to be.